Recording from the Sunshine City, St. Petersburg, Florida, overlooking beautiful Tampa Bay, this is the Sonography Lounge, sponsored by Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute. This podcast is dedicated to medical professionals and patients around the world interested in diagnostic and interventional ultrasound. Our podcast will discuss everything ultrasound, from news, trends, career paths, new technology, and industry updates. Hosted by Lori Green and Tricia Rio of Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute, they bring over four decades of experience in the ultrasound profession and are here to guide you through this journey. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sonography Lounge, sponsored by Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute, where we discuss all things ultrasound. I'm Lori Green, and I will be co-hosting today's episode with Trisha Rio. Hey, everyone. So, Trisha, you know, what happens is uh, ultrasound over the years has expanded Mm -hmm. exponentially across multiple specialty practices. And as that happens, the amount of ultrasound research and available literature is also expanding. And uh, it's so important for all of us to keep up to date on uh, emerging technologies and new techniques and so forth in the, in the ultrasound profession. So the literature is really critical as it helps to keep us up to date so we can utilize ultrasound in a safe and appropriate way to help our patients. Right. For a lot of people, just saying the word research can cause a lot of anxiety, and they just like want to run away. (laughs) It seems pretty overwhelming and intimidating for many who do not have the experience with reading, interpreting, and applying the research to their daily clinical activities. But never fear. No worries, because we at the Sonography Lounge are here to help. That's right. In today's episode, we will demystify ultrasound research and give you the information you need to be able to confidently read the available literature out there and then utilize that information to improve patient care. We're so thrilled to have with us Dr. Mike Pratz, who is the Assistant Ultrasound Director and Director of Ultrasound Research in the Department of Emergency Medicine at The Ohio State University. Dr. Pratz is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning Ultrasound Gel podcast, which reviews literature and point-of-care ultrasound. So welcome, Dr. Pratz. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here. I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. So let's just kick it off and start out by having you tell our listeners how you got involved with evidence-based synology and why you feel ultrasound research is unique and important to understand. Definitely. I would love to. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. So I think my experience kind of started in my emergency ultrasound fellowship. And this was around the time that um, there was this big boom in evidence-based medicine in general. And it's not like people had not based their practice on evidence prior to this, but they kind of made it seem that way. But it was really just a a rebranding of this idea that let's focus in on doing things based on what the research shows us is the best care. So I was like, you know what? I love that idea. It seems smart. It seems like the best way to do things. But I didn't see a lot of it directly applying to ultrasound. And I suspected maybe that was because ultrasound is a little bit new in the house of medicine. It's, I mean, it's been going on for a long time, but compared to a lot of other things, maybe it's a little bit new. And certainly with regard to a lot of the newer applications and all these point of care uses, different people using the ultrasound that weren't 20 years ago. So in that sense, it is relatively new compared to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And what I observed was that there was kind of this dichotomy that some people who loved ultrasound, like all of us here, I think we, whenever we became more comfortable with it as we grew our skills, we we realized, you know, whatever I see, I really start to trust that. I can, I believe what I'm seeing on my screen. I know how to manipulate the transducer and understand the anatomy that I'm visualizing. And so you can really sometimes believe everything you see and, and think like every everything on the screen, that's what's going on. Yeah. And sometimes that does lead to a little bit of over um, trusting of the ultrasound. But on the other hand, there's a similar risk. People who don't know ultrasound or are unfamiliar with it or just never were able to incorporate it into their practice, they aren't using ultrasound in a a valuable way where it has been proven to be useful for patients. So both of those things are, I don't want to say dangerous, but I guess they could be actually dangerous to patient care if you're not doing the best thing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where the podcast got its origin in that first of all we were trying to figure out how we could discuss ultrasound without 
visualizing ultrasound. So talking about the research is one way to do that because you don't need to show any images. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so then we started crunching through these papers. I love to analyze them and think about them. So we wanted to share with others so that hopefully everybody can start practicing ultrasound based on the most recent research and serve our patients the best. Awesome. Yeah, that makes total sense. It makes total sense. And especially in the uh, point of care, you know, air arena, there's a lot of people who are new to this technology. And even once you start using it for one application, and then you start utilizing it for others. And the next thing you know, I mean, that especially in emergency medicine, you, know, you might start out with vascular access or, or the fast exam. And the next thing you know, you know, you're looking at Tonsil, tonsils for abscess and vocal things, cords, like, vocal and, cords exactly. and all that kind of thing. But you know, <laughs> we do the presentation. One thing leads to another. Exactly, it's sure pretty does. much of a domino effect. But it's also, you know, so great because you know, you're taking a technology that's you know non-invasive. It's safe for the patient and basically learning to utilize it for so many applications that can be life-saving. So if the literature is available and people know how to analyze it so that they can be more confident that what they're doing is truly evidence-based, then that's um, just going to be the best for all parties. So how do you actually find articles and then determine if they're of great value or, you know, really can make the difference in, in whether you apply that in your clinical practice or not? Yeah, I'm, I can definitely go through that because um, it's something I put a lot of thought into. I wanted to clarify a quick thing that we said earlier because you mentioned like using ultrasound in the emergency department. You could use it in for vascular access. There's all sorts of specialties and all sorts of um, different providers that are using ultrasound these days. Right. And I think that's um, a key point when we talk about this topic in general. And that's why at the beginning... Um, we, I kind of call it evidence-based synology, and I have to give a shout out to Dr. Dave Boehner, who I think was the first person I heard call it synology. Mm -hmm. And the reason it, it, we're calling it that instead of traditionally what we call sonography is because if you think about the roots of the words, the sonography is actually like the image acquisition. You're writing in the images. But synology is just a more general term that's saying it's not just about getting the images, it's about knowing when the images are indicated, when you should get an ultrasound, getting the images, and that's a, that's a whole thing in itself, and then also interpreting the images and knowing how to and knowing how to put that into your clinical practice. So all those things together are what we would term synology, and each one of those steps is what makes the research in ultrasound so tricky because you can have weaknesses in studies at every one of those steps. Maybe you're doing the ultrasound for the wrong reason, so it's kind of doesn't make sense, or you're not getting the right training to do this, so that makes a confounder or weakness in the study. So all those different steps in the process are, are why literature in ultrasound is a little unique. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with that. You're right. There's just, it's so complicated. And it's not just, okay, I, I learned how to do ultrasound and now I can do ultrasound of everything. Well, no, that's not how it works. We have to make sure that we're doing it and we're using it in the appropriate manner, that we're understanding what the information is telling us. And that, yes, that's evidence-based use of it. Because otherwise you're just reinventing the wheel and going rogue. <laughs> <laughs> and what right. do you do with that information once you have it? You know, that's right. a key point. You know, to, right to make sure that you're utilizing that uh, information to, you know, change the management of your patient, perhaps. Yeah. I would totally. say that yep. a really good example of that would be the use of lung ultrasound, mm -hmm. right? So right. during the pandemic, mm. we saw the use of lung ultrasound, the interest in it skyrocket. <laughs> Luckily, we had a lot of evidence-based synology out there that proved, okay, this is a reliable technique to use. We can use this, and it's going to yield appropriate results that are similar to, if not better than, doing a chest X-ray or doing a CT scan. Mm -hmm. But I think that's definitely a really good example. And a lot of people became familiar with ultrasound from that time because of lung ultrasound yeah. and the way mm -hmm. we used it. That's a really great point because the literature definitely reflects what's going on in practice and, and vice versa. They inform each other. So if things are changing in clinical practice, it's going to be researched more. If there's more research coming out on something, people may change their practice based on it. Yeah. So 
getting back to that question about what makes an article good, mm-hmm. I think it does really require a knowledge of what's been done and the overall historical context of what research has been done on this before, what's the current practice, and what is this hoping to change. So you need to have a good research question. And then beyond that, it doesn't always have to be like a super high rigorous study, like a randomized controlled trial and everything. As long as you have a good question that builds on what's been done and then a study design that attempts to answer that in a reasonable way, then then what determines if it's good beyond that is really just looking for any sort of logical fallacies in the conclusions that they're trying to draw. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not too tricky once you've got uh, read a couple ultrasound articles to see some common mistakes that are made. And I guess when I'm looking for these, one thing I would recommend is just knowing what sort of journals you can trust and at least starting with some sort of indexed journals. That's that's just a way of saying like they've met a certain bar to be included in in an online collection of journals, which can be like PubMed or Embase or Medline or something like that. Just a, a little bit more trustable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yep. <clears throat> I know that's always a, oftentimes a question for us when some of our participants were they'll be like, where can I find more information on this, you know, mm-hmm. and do I just, where do I start? Yeah. And uh, so that's a good point to s- just start with the Give them some journals places that to are go. known. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And nowadays, as compared to even like 10 years ago, there's a lot of systematic reviews that are out there on ultrasound. So that might be a good starting place for a lot of questions because it collects all the studies that have been done to date and can give you kind of a feel for what what the sway is for the results. Mm. Okay. Well, now we know how to identify a good article, but what would you say are some of the pitfalls um, that you or you have seen others Um, kind of experience in interpreting the ultrasound literature? You know, can you kind of provide our listeners with some pointers on how to take research data and then integrate that into their practice? Yeah, definitely. I I think that there are some things that are unique to ultrasound, and there's some things that are just part of practicing medicine in general. So some common pitfalls might be excluding populations that you actually care about. So, for example, if we're talking about lung ultrasound in COVID-19, if you're going to exclude the patients that have COVID-19, then you have to recognize that's a pretty large population that you're not going to be able to apply this data to. Or a lot of studies exclude the most critically ill patients because it's hard to consent them. And um, that means sometimes the ultrasound actually isn't being studied in a population you want to apply it to later on. So you just have to be a little bit careful about that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I've noticed is um, the protocols or um, the software that is sometimes required for these studies can not be widely available. So sometimes there's these really cool studies where they're taking either um, artificial intelligence or they're using some sort of special software like speckle tracking and then reapplying it in a in an unusual way. Like I saw one paper that's using um, speckle tracking but on lung sliding. And that's just not commercially available to most people. So it's a really cool idea and it's hypothesis generating, but it may not be practical to apply in most places yet. Mm, Good point. And I guess the last thing that we mentioned briefly is the training of people because some of these novel uses of ultrasound, it can be anywhere from like we gave them a quick 20 minute lecture and hands on session on doing this novel ultrasound or it's like we did a four day course, we in depth went through all these things and we tested them and we made sure that everyone was competent in this certain scan before we let them collect the data. And that really changes as as the reader how much you know you are going to be similar to the population that was tested. Like, do I have those skills? Did I undergo that training? Am I going to be able to reproduce these results when I try it on my own patients? Those are the types of questions you got to be asking. Mm. And I think that's an important designation because it's not how trained or how experienced were the people actually in the research article, but comparing how trained and experienced am I compared to the people who are writing this research article? 
Because like you said, Mm -hmm. we're trying to reproduce what they're doing in our patient care. And if you've never performed a cardiac ultrasound before, you're not going to just go watch a video and then go do cardiac ultrasound. Mm -hmm. It's just not that simple. So it's a good point. Right. And do you have the technology available to you? Right. Yeah, if they're using AI (laughs) and you don't have that, (laughs) it's going to be a definite (laughs) problem. Yeah. 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 And there's still there's still a good place for those types of studies. Like we need those to keep pushing the the boundaries of our knowledge. But when it comes to incorporating it into your own practice, those are some big considerations. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I would have thought of that. So I'm glad that we reviewed that because that's yeah, certainly when, something to pay attention to. I, I agree. And really, when it comes to taking the available research, kind of going through it, understanding it, seeing if it's a good study, that's that's just the first step because you asked an important question of how do you then decide to integrate it into your practice? When do, And that really comes down to when do I change my practice based on new evidence that's coming out? And for me, I, th- I did a little thinking about this and I really asked myself four questions. The first is, what is my current practice and how evidence-based is that? Because I think a lot of our our listeners can agree that some of the things that we do in medicine are not based on very good evidence. We've just been doing it for like a hundred years. And so everybody just keeps doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So figure out, that's the first step. How good is the evidence for what I'm currently doing? Then you say, all right, this new study, how good is this evidence for this new thing that's going to try to change my practice? Is it better than the old evidence that's been there? Or is it just like a single case report? You know, rarely do I change my practice based on a single paper. Um, Only sometimes if it meets all the other criteria, I guess. So the third and a very important question is, what is the risk of this new practice? Is this something that is potentially risky in that you should wait for a really high level of evidence, you know, multiple studies showing a benefit before you really take on a little extra risk in changing your practice? Mm Mm-hmm. And of course, along with that, you should always follow your local practices. You don't want to be the one rogue who's doing this crazy new procedure based on ultrasound, based on a single paper, and then, you know, hopefully nothing bad happens and it just doesn't reflect well on you if you're not following what everyone else is doing and what's the agreed upon practices in your your local practice. Yeah. And the last the last question I think is does this change make sense to your practice? And that's really two parts. Is is this evidence, this new evidence that's coming out, is it something that seems like a logical benefit would come from it? Does it seem to to match? Or does it seem like you don't understand why this would, would be a benefit? Does it seem unbelievable, too good to be true? I take a little bit more pause then. Mm-hmm. And then what we, the second half of that is what we discussed earlier. It's just making sure that it, it affects your practice. It, it, it is applicable to the populations that you work with and your own individual practice. So I feel like, you know, a really good example that we can look at that as he reviewed those four questions would be integrating contrast into echo studies, you know, bubble studies and things like that. I feel like it really just, if you look back, it really followed those four questions and you could kind of see that evolution naturally occurring. With implementing it. Yeah, absolutely. Because when they first started yeah. utilizing contrast, you know, it was primarily that, you know, it was a nurse or a physician that had to be in the room and all those things. And then there's also been some, you know, contraindications that have, you know, subsequently been found. And so through research and uh, so forth, they've determined different ways of utilizing contrast, but also it's, it's basically being performed on a daily basis. And the, the sonographer, is the one who makes that decision on when they need to use it and actually, you know, yeah, does the injection and so forth. That's pretty Yeah, cool. exactly. And it's there's a similar um, newer movement to use contrast in like, you know, abdominal sonography or even yeah. in the emergency department, we've been talking about using it in traumas to look for solid organ injury or maybe to increase the sensitivity of a fast scan. So it's really cool to see that develop. Like it starts off as an idea and they're like, yeah, that would be great if we could be more sensitive with our ultrasounds. And then how good's the evidence? Well, it's building, it's pretty good. 
we, we know that the FAST exam is, is pretty well studied in, in the emergency medicine and trauma literature, and we, we are building off of that now. And then what's the risk? Like you mentioned, I mean, ultrasound contrast in general is, is pretty safe, right. but yeah, there, there are some considerations in terms of contraindications. Yeah. So based on that discussion and then building some protocols in your practice, I think it's, you can start to think about when it's appropriate to integrate that into practice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are great. The I, You kind of just read my mind when you said those four questions, because that was what I was going to ask is how do they, how do you start to make that decision on, on whether you utilize a new technique or application right. to, based on what you're reading in an article, you know, is it a one, one article or has there been a lot of information out there that you just have to kind of assimilate it in your mind and figure out which way to go with it so that's a yeah cool. really really uh, simply put it's almost just like you have a scale like one of those old justice scales and on the one side is the old evidence and the old practice and then the other side is the new evidence and you're trying to just wait for enough that it tilts in favor of the new practice yeah that's a good visual I like that mm-hmm but yeah, I can definitely see, like Lori said, it's once you hear those four questions, it's like, well, yeah, duh. Like, that's how you would do it, right? <laughs> it so, makes perfect sense. Does. But when you're. But when, the, you just think about research. Oh, I have to read all these long papers with big words. I don't know about all this. And then. It's how not do as I bad as it that? sounds. <laughs> yeah. And then how do I take that and apply it to my current practice and make sure that I'm, you know, doing what's best for my patient? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. It's, a, it's a hard thing to to do I agree it can be really daunting and people are strapped for time it's like when do I fit that into my schedule but I I think if you think about each research um, paper as kind of like a story in the overall narrative I I kind of like the idea of it just is adding a little bit it's telling things a different way you can see how the history of ultrasound is growing and developing and adding to the story it doesn't have to be all about understanding like the the crazy methodology and the statistics that they're utilizing. It's more so like, what, how is this changing what I'm doing and how is this building on the past? So it can be kind of a cool, a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that simplifies it for those who are a little intimidated, you know, when they read an article or they don't, sometimes they don't read them at all because they just, you know, like you said, that. you start looking at the statistical data and you're like, la, 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 you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and but I mean, it's important, but if you can, you know, get out of the article, how it applies to your, your clinical practice and how it will benefit your patients, then that's the most important yeah. part of it. So, and I would think I like most story. often, most people are pick up a journal article and read it because it's already a question that they have. Right. Like, right. I've been thinking about this. I've heard about this. I want to know more about this. So it seems like, you know, if you can take that information and like you said, set aside all the statistical methodology, all that stuff, obviously that's important and that's what makes the paper meaningful, the research meaningful. But if you can set all that aside and just focus on the story, we started with a question and here's our answer. And how is that going to help me improve my patient outcomes? And how is that? How am I going to apply that in my daily clinical practice? Right, makes a lot more sense. I know for me, like yeah. if I'm, yeah. I'm a member of many societies, and you know, you get journal after journal after journal, and they're just, you know, there's so many articles, and there's not that much time. So I just go through, and I that's what I'm looking for is what what am I interested in, or is there a new technique that might help us to better, you know, teach others and so forth or a new technique. So I go through and I just highlight the ones that kind of speak to me. And then I, I read those first. And then if I get to the others, fine. But those were the ones that caught my attention. So mm-hmm. and that might be a way for people to, mm-hmm. to start. And is that, uh, you know, Dr. Press, do you, when you're doing your gel podcast and you're reviewing literature and so forth, are you like selecting articles that are have been published, you know, in the any many of these journals, or or yeah. are you kind of coming up with a, a question because something came up in your clinical practice and that, did, you know, determined whether you went out and did a, a publication search. That's a good question. It's a little bit of both, but the majority of the time, 
It's that I'm just constantly scanning the new literature that's out there and looking for things that I think are interesting. And fortunately, there's tons of new research coming out all the time. Mm -hmm. There's and there's two really two ways you can get it. I mean, you can do what you're describing. You subscribe to journals, you look through them, and um, you know take the time to find out what's interesting, what you think could change your practice, or just something that you're curious about. Um, but there's also ways that you can use technology to help push the the data to you. And I know that's that's becoming more common. You know, instead of having to remember like, oh, I gotta go to do a quick search and make sure I'm not missing any articles. It w it's more convenient for a lot of people to have something that pushes you data. And that can be in the form of a podcast or actually like PubMed is a great resource because you can set your own emails. Um, so you can go and do any search on PubMed. You could say like, I'm interested in uh, trauma ultrasound. You do your little search and then you could say, email me the results of this search like every week or every month. And it could just um, send you the newest articles on that topic. So that's that's an interesting way you can just browse through what's been published this week on that in that topic and see if anything is worth digging into. Nice. That's a really good um, suggestion. I have that as well. And I, you know, you might not even be thinking about it, and then I get this little email that, oh, this article was just published, and da da da. And you're like, that's like oh, the smart yes. brief that we get. Yeah. From the ARDMS. Mm -hmm. yeah, AR, yeah. ARDMS does that as well. Yeah. Right. And the podcasts are great. So. I think those are all good suggestions on how people can get started. Is there anything like in the ultrasound research today going on that you you know that you're like actively either doing the research or you're looking for some of the research that is new in ultrasound? Well, there's a lot going on and I'm always interested most in what a lot of these big multi-center studies are, are building mm -hmm. towards. I, I think one of my personal interests and the type of studies that get me most excited are all the things that are going on in cardiac arrest, ultrasound research, because yes. there's certainly tons of studies and tons of different aspects of that that are being studied. Everything from prognostication to um, using transesophageal echo and a lot of the um, outcomes associated with using ultrasound. So I always love those those types of um, studies when they come out. Uh, but there's nothing in particular that I am anticipating mm -hmm. in terms of specific studies. I, I think in general, I am looking forward to how ultrasound is now being incorporated more into standard practice and seeing that show up in our studies. So um, this was an idea that uh, Vicky, Dr. Vicki Noble mentioned on my podcast a couple months ago, and it was a really good point that I hadn't thought about, about how ultrasound is often studied in isolation. Like we're just looking, how accurate is ultrasound for, for this? Or how accurate is ultrasound for that? Let's eliminate all the other confounders, just look at ice, <clears throat> ultrasound. But that's not actually how we use it. And it's a little bit of a heavy burden for a diagnostic test to try to make a difference in patient outcomes, you know, the outcomes that we really care about, like their their morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. So instead, I think in the future, the way things are heading are trying to incorporate ultrasound naturally as, as one tool in the toolbox of patient care and seeing how it can improve things when it's added to the care that we're providing. Yeah. So that's that's what I'm looking for. Those types of outcomes that our patients care about, um, such as, you know, this saved me so much time in getting to the operating room because we made the diagnosis faster. Right. And therefore, this patient was in the hospital not as long. That would be great to see. Those types of outcomes um, where it's not 100% based on the ultrasound, but the ultrasound was used appropriately in helping the patient's care and shows a benefit. Yeah. I feel like that kind of came up <clears throat> last week. We hosted our emergency medicine and critical care course. And I, I was surprised, and I, Lori may agree with me on this one, at how many people walked in the door already saying, yeah, I use ultrasound. I do like the FAST exam or I use it for ultrasound guided vascular access. It felt like almost the entire course all of the participants came in with some baseline level, which mm -hmm. I feel like is new. Right. I don't feel like you know mm -hmm. two years ago we saw that. Right. 
And it was funny because they understood it as a tool in a toolbox. You would hear them say those very words. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of many tools in my toolbox. You know, it's going to be like my new stethoscope. And we've heard all this stuff being rattled off in the literature and by various people who are huge proponents of ultrasound, mm-hmm. um, point-of-care ultrasound specifically. But now you're hearing the participants coming in and saying it. And it was funny because they would take something we were teaching them. For instance, we were teaching them the rush exam. And we're like, okay, so I can look at the right side of the heart. And I could say, okay, the right side of the heart looks big. And I feel like my patient's presenting with a potential PE. You know, they have the symptoms of that. So now I can do X, Y, and Z with the ultrasound. Go look at these various components. Look at their IVC, their DVT exam. And put that all together in a clinical picture. And then you know, maybe verify that with another diagnostic test, but I can initiate treatment sooner because I'm pretty confident based on what I've seen with this tool that that's what I'm dealing with. But I have other tools I'm going to use as well. And I just like how they're putting it all together. And I feel like that's definitely something we saw a few people doing, but this time it was almost every participant I worked with was kind of doing that. So the research is helping. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's good to hear because it is easy for ultrasound enthusiasts to really like push the ultrasound to the forefront and I think that's appropriate at times but it is important I always love to emphasize that it's it can't be everything you can't use it it is possible to use ultrasound too much I guess I could say and you have to be able to know the appropriate place use all the other information that's available and that's really where it's going to shine as a tool yeah absolutely Awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that this has been such a helpful conversation in just breaking things down, but also exciting. You know, mm-hmm. people listening are like, I, I'm more excited now to go read an article. I'm more excited now to consider how ultrasound could impact my patient care and my patient outcomes. So I always appreciate when we have conversations that kind of spark that interest right. and get that fire lit in people's bellies. Right. Or if they wanted to be able to integrate it, but they didn't really have the documentation and the research to support it they now you know have a starting point and they know those four questions to ask when they're interpreting and analyzing an article to help them to take that next step to put it into practice yeah that's a great way to put it i think it ultra uh I think that research can be intimidating for people, like you've mentioned, and it's not everybody's favorite topic, but if you play upon what a lot of us have is like a curiosity towards like, I wonder what would happen if I did this, or I wonder if this could be a little bit better. That's the basis for a lot of these articles. And I think that it is possible to become interested in it. And there's lots of resources out there now that make it a lot easier to get these studies and digest these studies and get expert opinions on if this is something that you should base your practice on or not. So it's easier now more than ever to be able to get access to the latest literature and try to incorporate it into your practice. Yeah. Well, Dr. Pratz, we want to thank you so much for joining us today and just breaking all of that down for us, how to better utilize the research and just how to find the research, what questions we should be asking ourselves as we're reading the research. I just think this has all been so helpful, Um, you know, and I just think it's going to be a great benefit to all of our listeners, regardless of how it is they're going to implement this, you know, because... Across the board, I think everybody can stand to learn more about how ultrasound can be integrated in a point-of-care aspect, even sonographers. I think that them understanding how it's used by the physicians in the ED and on the critical care floors and how they can complement that rather than maybe fight against it. Right. So I just yeah, yeah, even other specialty practices. All of them. Family yeah, medicine, just across the board. Across the board. Just more yep. synergistic look at it. Yep. So thank you so much for joining us today. Right. Absolutely. It was a great discussion, and we really appreciate you being with us today, Dr. Pratt. And a big thank you to our listeners. Um, glad you could join us. Even our window washers are out there right now hanging around listening. <laughs> <laughs> if you're hearing any clunking, that's why. <laughs> of all days, right? Um, but uh, thank you again to our listeners. Be sure to check out Dr. Pratt's podcast, Ultrasound Gel Podcast. It's available on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform. And uh, we'll have extra information in our show notes. And uh, we thank you all for joining us again. Have a great day and happy scanning. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pratt. We really appreciate it. Sure. It's been a pleasure talking to you both. Thanks so much for this opportunity.
Absolutely. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Sonography Lounge. Don't forget, if you like this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram, at Sonography Lounge, and Twitter, at Sonography LNG. If you have any questions, comments, or topic suggestions, feel free to send an email to us at sonographylounge at gmail.com. Have a great week and scan, scan, scan.